Good afternoon. I am Hélène Rebillard, president of Taliaco. Although I speak only, uh, oh, oh, although I speak only a little English, I do want to say a warm hello to you all, and thank you for being with us for this video conference. You are very important to Paliaco, and we appreciate your support very much. Have a good afternoon and enjoy the presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Gladys Simons, and I'm a proud volunteer with Paliaco, that wonderful organization that offers accompaniment, respite care, and support for cancer patients, for caretakers, for those living with loss. And we offer our services in both French and English in the Laurentians and surrounding areas. And it is my pleasure today on behalf of Peliaco to introduce you to an extraordinary man in these extraordinary times. Dr. Brian Goldman is one of those rare individuals who has been successful in a number of adrenaline pumping careers. He is an emergency physician at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. He is the host of CBC's White Coat Black Art, a very interesting radio program on the healthcare system. He is the house doctor on uh, CBC Radio One in Saskatchewan. He is a reassuring voice during this time of COVID-19. On top of that, he is a fabulous public speaker, as you're about to witness, and he's an author. How he does all this is beyond me, but he has written three award-winning uh, books, and the latest one is The Power of Kindness, The uh, Importance of Empathy in Everyday Life. And Dr. Goldman will address this issue of how to create a culture of kindness in this pandemic era. So without further ado, Dr. Goldman, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Gladys. It is a pleasure to be uh, seeing you now. Uh, you said I'm a great public speaker and I hope that that means I'm also a great virtual speaker because of course, this is not the way we planned it, but it is what we have to live with. And we wanna remember that these are tough times with COVID, with what's going on in Quebec, in Ontario, where I practice medicine and in many parts of the rest of Canada. It's a reminder that what makes this special is that we are in this together. And I, and I want you to, to feel that way. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see my presentation, my slides. And, and you know, Gladys thinks that, that you should have a big image of me. Um, I think you should probably have a smaller image of me, but uh, I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, and we're gonna share it and here we go. All right, so I want you to be able to read my slides. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, we're gonna talk about my journey, my personal journey to empathy and kindness. We're gonna talk about the growing need for family and informal caregivers uh, to have their needs met at or near the end of life, something that Paliaco does beautifully. And of course, I'll talk about some of the added challenges tr of trying to meet those needs during COVID-19. And, and I'll, you know, I'll talk about my own personal journey to empathy and kindness, some tips for you on how to be the kindest person you can in these difficult times. And, and then finally, what does an empathic, empathic and kind system look like during the time of, pan of the pandemic? Uh, I have a Twitter uh, feed. My Twitter handle is at nightshiftmd. Um, I don't, my children have Instagram accounts. I don't have an Instagram account. Uh, it's just a little too racy for me. Uh, my views are my own, uh, not those of the CBC. And I certainly welcome if you wish to live tweet what I'm doing, just as long as you spell my name correctly. Uh, we cannot uh, avoid talking about COVID, and I spent much of yesterday and today trying to catch up on, on what the President of the United States is going through right now. I just want to say off the top that whatever your politics, we wish he and the First Lady and all the other people who uh, uh, have become infected with COVID-19 in Canada and in the United States a full and speedy recovery. 
I'm going to begin by uh, telling you a personal story. This really happened. And it's the story of a 68-year-old woman with end-stage multiple sclerosis who was brought to my emergency department where I was on duty. Her family asked that she be admitted to hospital. And as often happens under these circumstances, you know, this is the kind of situation that, that not infrequently uh, we experience as emergency physicians where a family has been taking care of their loved one at home and has reached the point that they feel that they can no longer deliver uh, appropriate care. They're actually afraid that they might do something. You know, they sense that the end may be near. They are terrified that they are going to precipitate the end or do something wrong. And that's a theme that I'm going to get back to in a few minutes that people don't uh, feel as if they have the training to take care of a loved one at or near the end of life. And so they ask that she be admitted to hospital. And, and you know, the emergency physician who saw her uh, was no fool, not the kind of person who says, I will, not, I will not do what you ask. He made the referral to the internal medicine team, but it took hours, like 10 hours for her to be seen. And in that interval of time, uh, the family asked the emergency physician again and again and again, when will my mother get a bed? I don't know. Can you estimate when my mother will get a bed when she sees the internal medicine team? When will my mother see the internal medicine team? I don't know. Can you estimate when she will see the internal medicine team? And, and this went on and on every time the emergency physician passed by this very busy shift. And you know why was she not seen for a long time? Well, we have this thing called triage, which means to sort. And, and the sickest patients get seen sooner. It's not first come, first served. At any time, you could be the next person to be seen. But if somebody sicker comes in, then they come first. Anyway. About the 17th time uh, that the emergency physician was asked uh, what's doing with my mother, he snapped at them, very uncharacteristic. He didn't say, you know, didn't yell at them. He said, I did what you asked and moved and moved on. Eventually she was seen by the internal medicine team. She was admitted to hospital. And sadly, a few months later, she passed away, not unexpectedly. And a few months after that, the physician received a letter, a beautifully handwritten letter from the family accusing him of unkindness, inviting him to meet with the family so that the family could tell him what kind of a woman this, his patient was, what kind of a mother, grandmother, what kind of wife, what kind of worker she was, all the things that he might have valued knowing while she was alive. And also, as, as was written in the note, to see if there was any residual kindness lurking under all the brusqueness demonstrated by that emergency physician. Not a nice thing to hear, but it was the truth. And, and um, let me see. I have already given away that that was me. I'm not gonna tell tales about other physicians. I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about myself. And, and um, it's a reminder that, that you know, I just, let me just go back to that in just a second. Um, the, the emergency physician was me. And a lot of people ask, did you, did you go to that meeting? Yeah, I went to that meeting. And they told me all the things I wish I'd known. And they cried and I cried and we became friends. And in fact, it was that story that launched me on the journey to find out, was I still a kind soul? I think that's something that everybody needs to ask themselves at one point in their lives. Maybe you're under stress, maybe you know, things aren't going well. Maybe during COVID-19, yeah, you know, there have been some incredible acts of kindness during COVID-19, but there's also this stress level. And that, as you'll find out in a few minutes, uh, puts you off your kindness and empathic game. You know, the, your, your natural ability to be kind tends to take a back seat to managing your stress and trying to take care of your family under, under those circumstances. Um, and, and, and that's what set me off on the journey. And uh, I'm going to share what I've learned about my journey in a few minutes. But I want to remind you that, that um, you know, there was another aspect to this story that, that, that I, I didn't appreciate at the time. And it was only later when I started to deal with my own family that I, I came to, to appreciate it. I was younger at that time. This was in the early 1990s. Uh, my parents were well, they were living together at home. Um, you know, they, they did not need me to be a care provider for them. So I really, 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 even though we had a good meeting and they cried and I cried, I had no idea what they were going through at that time. Later on, I did. And this is, this is just a slide to remind you that every five minutes in this country, somebody is diagnosed with dementia. 
And in the early 1990s, it was my mother's turn to be diagnosed with dementia. And this is a photograph of my parents, Sam and Shirley Goldman, on the occasion of their 50th wedding anniversary, which was one of the last good times that when they were together. And I can tell you that I remember very clearly, you know, how my father steadfastly looked after my mother uh, from the time she was diagnosed with uh, dementia, with Alzheimer's dementia for the next 15 years, how he went from being her uh, partner to being her social convener, her, her exercise coach, you know, her accountant, her bookkeeper, her personal care aide, until eventually one day she developed shingles in the neck and stopped swallowing. And she was dehydrated to within an inch of her life. And when she was admitted to the hospital and rehydrated, uh, the doctors on the admitting team basically read the riot act to my dad and gave him a choice. They said, you can either preside over her death at home or you can uh, have her live on in long-term care. And, and he did. He had her placed in long-term care where she lived the last three years of her life and it broke his heart emotionally. And six months later, he had his first heart attack and congestive heart failure. And for the last year and a half or so of his life, was, was uh, in and out of hospital and living a very difficult existence as people in their late 80s, early 90s often, often do. And, you know, I can remember on the last day of his life when he was brought to hospital against his wishes, he was having chest pain, he had inoperable coronary artery disease. And it was the night that, that uh, I had just done an emergency shift uh, I was, I, I had been up for 40 hours by the time I said goodnight to him. And I, I wasn't actually there when he died. I went home, I was suffering from sleep deprivation. And I remember looking at my partner Tamara's face as she shook me awake. And I just took one look at her stricken face and I knew that he died. And I went back to the hospital, sat at the bedside of, of my father who had just died. And my sister was there, my brother-in-law were there and in walked a physician who I remembered from, from my days at Sinai when he was a resident and he looked terrified. And I could just imagine that he was thinking, you know, I had this, the father of this famous doctor and I couldn't keep him alive for one night. And I knew that he was in distress and I found myself saying the words, thank you very much for looking after my dad. Uh, and and he, he kind of relaxed. He said, take all the time you need and he left. And it was really at that moment that I understood what the other family had been going through because I was going through the same thing myself and felt that sense of, of lack of caring for family members, for essential family caregivers. By then I had been providing, my sister and I had been providing a lot of care for, uh, for um, uh, our parents. Uh, my mother was still alive at that time. She died about 11 months later. But it was those two stories, the story of that first family, that, that woman with multiple sclerosis and, and the death of my, of, of, of my dad and that kind of lack of empathy at the bedside there. You know, that, that internist tuning into his own distress, which is what I was doing with that other family, tuning into my own distress or perhaps shame at not, not being able to answer the family's questions, not be able to get her admitted, you know, that patient admitted as quickly as possible. And it was those two stories that set me on the journey that I will share with you uh, in, in, in the time I have left. Uh, and, and uh, you know, this is a nod to remember that the husband of that woman and my dad and eventually my sister and I were part of this cohort of 8.1 million Canadians who are what the Canadian Institute for Health Information refers to as informal family caregivers. Let's call them unpaid family caregivers. Uh, some people have called them essential, some people have called them a nuisance, um, but I can tell you they provide a lot of hours of care for loved ones at home and sometimes in hospitals and long-term care facilities as we've learned through COVID. And you know, some provinces offer refundable tax credits. The uh, liberal program, which was announced some years ago, uh, offers non-refundable tax credits. But if they were paid a job, even at the rate of the lowliest wage uh, in Canada for uh, personal care aides or personal support workers, they would, as a group, generate an astonishing economic output of $25 billion a year. So my hat's off to essential family caregivers if, you're, if, you're, if you are experiencing that now. And that's something that Paliaco can help you with 
uh, because they understand what you are going through. Now, how often do we listen to what essential family caregivers have to say? And up until very recently, not much at all. And I want to share with you an experience I had some years ago on White Coat where they spend a lot of time listening back from patients, former patients, and family members of former patients. And, and that's part of what they call uh, family, patient and family-centered care. They have what are called patient experience advisors. And I got to meet a whole bunch of them, which you can see on the slide in front of you, in the photo in front of you. And one of them is Ellen Batter who was a patient experience advisor and for years she had been uh, a caregiver, an essential family caregiver to her husband who had dementia. And I wanna play a little bit of what she, she had her husband to the emergency department. He had dementia and so those trips were frequent. I was um, amazed at the lack of communication in the emergency department um, by the time my husband on one occasion by the time we were in and out of there I had had to inform seven people that he had dementia the, the the message never got passed on and I had to talk about his dementia in front of him it was very demeaning um, I, I think uh, I, ju I just had the general um, feeling that uh, we were dismissed um, and that I you know, you have a special um, uh, connection with your spouse when your spouse has a dementia and, and you, you don't want to speak for them, but you know you need to supplement that. And, and so I was never spoken to. It, it was just not pleasant. And that was before COVID. And, you know, what do we have today with COVID? We have 120,000 cases and climbing in Canada. We have uh, more than 61,000 in Quebec, more than 9,000 deaths in Canada, 5,700 in Quebec, 95% of COVID-19 uh, deaths in Canadians have occurred in people over the age of 60, uh, 78 point, actually it's closer to 81% of the deaths stemming from long-term care and seniors homes, especially in Quebec. Uh, it's been called a national disgrace. And, and it is something that, that uh, we have not seen the last of as we move into the second wave of COVID-19. And I hope that we've learned some of those lessons. In addition to the death rate, we have restricted visitor hours and, and hospitals have been placed uh, on lockdown. Uh, we know that happened during the, the, uh, the first wave. Uh, essential family caregivers not infrequently were mislabeled as visitors as if they were just casual visitors. When I can tell you, that particularly my sister, when she visited my mother in long-term care back in 2012, 2013, 2014, she would come into the, into, in, into the long-term care facility once if not twice a day to feed my mom. Uh, and, and certainly Donna Morgan knows a lot about that uh, during COVID-19. She knows the impact of the restricted visiting hours. Her dad, Russ, was hospitalized with a stroke during the first wave of uh, COVID-19 in British Columbia. And before COVID-19, she would visit and provide care every day. I want you to hear a little bit of, of what it was like to not be able to visit Russ when he was hospitalized during COVID because he had a stroke. Well, it's just been terrible because the worry that we have about his both his physical health and his mental health uh, being so isolated is very overwhelming. And it's been very difficult for my mother. She's coping with being on her own for the first time in 64 years and then worrying about her husband so much and not being able to stay in touch with him very well. What's it been like for your dad? I think he is lonely and bored because he has some dementia. Sometimes he has to remember that he's had a stroke. And then he also has to remember why none of us are visiting him. And it can be very heartbreaking on the phone when we, when we get the opportunity and we have to explain to him why we're not there and we wish we were there. Before the hospital closed uh, the ward to visitors, how often were you able to see him? We were there every day. You know, my mom and myself most days, but always at least one of us there every day. And and in addition to visiting him, would you you help care for him? 
Yes, we often try to go over a meal time and and just assist him. You know, he has some use of his right arm, which is good, but his left side is paralyzed. And so we would help him, you know, open the packages and containers for his lunch and, you know, get him the things he needed. So so that felt like a very important thing we were doing. And now we're not able to do that. And would you help with his rehab? We mainly, I think we were there as a kind of a cheerleading squad. We really encouraged him to do that. And I think that's really fallen away since we're not there to encourage him and explain to him that the rehab is what's going to get him uh, able to get ready to go home. Well, it's just been terrible. So, you know, some people will say that there are system reasons, good system reasons for excluding uh, essential family caregivers. You know, I'm, I'm gratified to, to be able to say that in many parts of Canada, uh, people who are identified as essential family caregivers are not being excluded from long-term care at this point. It's recognized how necessary they are to combat loneliness and to provide essential self-care, you know, care that uh, with activities of daily living that stressed out personal support workers do not have time to provide. Uh, that includes feeding, walking, you know, help with, with physio or rehab and, and, and sometimes even personal care. Uh, and, and, and these are things without which uh, seniors in long-term care, their health, their emotional and their physical health has deteriorated significantly uh, and that's among the survivors during COVID-19. So, so this is something that, that I'm glad they're starting to address. On the other hand, uh, as we move into greater and greater numbers of people with COVID-19 during the second wave, my fear is that hospitals will once again go into lockdown. And when they do, uh, the visiting policies will again be, uh, be curtailed and, 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 and make it even more difficult for loved ones to attend uh, people who are admitted to hospital who are very, very sick. So, so there are system reasons why that happens, but I also think that, that there's a role to play for lack of empathy in, uh, in dealing with people who have uh, uh, COVID-19, people who have to be in the healthcare system during the time of COVID-19, that includes dementia, people with dementia, people with cancer, uh, and their family members in particular. And, and so that's why I want to talk to you about, about empathy. And I'm going to begin by talking about some definitions. Uh, there's sympathy and there's empathy. Sympathy uh, is, uh, there is an official definition of sympathy, but, but I think for our purposes, I would call it a superficial gesture of concern uh, that is extended by somebody uh, who does not have a stake in the distress of the person uh, to whom they're extending it. In fact, you know, if you've ever said to yourself, I don't, I never know what to say at a funeral. I never know what to say at a visitation. I never know what to say at a graveside or, or, or when somebody loses their job, somebody suffers a grievous loss. And so we create these stock phrases like, sorry for your loss. And that brings me to a very important point. If you are anxious that you're going to be awkward in that moment, that you're not gonna know what to say, that you might put your foot in your mouth, you're anxious about that, just know that it's very difficult, understandably, very difficult to empathize with that other person while you're tuning into your own distress. You are best able to empathize with others when you can take your distress and put it aside momentarily. And there are techniques for doing that. I'll talk about those at the very end of my talk. That's sympathy. So we invent these conventions, these societal conventions, these cultural conventions that allow us to get past these moments without putting our foot in our mouths. And that's why people say things like, sorry for your loss as kind of a stock phrase. That's different from empathy. For our purposes, empathy is the capacity to imagine what it's like to be someone else and to have that inform your actions, not govern your actions, but inform them. And you, know, you may be aware that sometimes empathy means feeling what somebody else feels. That's known as affective or emotional empathy. Uh, and you know, certainly in the healthcare system, we don't want people to feel other people's pain. You know what mom feels when 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 her child uh, is getting stitches and and is an, in obvious distress. Not that it necessarily has to hurt, but that's emotional empathy, and and we don't want health professionals to have that because it's paralyzing. It 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 would tend to 
For instance, uh, an orthopedic surgeon who feels the postoperative pain of her patients would probably quit practicing orthopedic surgery that day. So we don't want that. We do want cognitive empathy. We want the ability to imagine what it's like to be someone else and have that inform your actions. Uh, so we want that and, and, uh, and we hope that health professionals have that in spades. Compassion is the doing part of empathy. It's what you do once you are aware of what it's like to be someone else. Uh, and, and, and so that's a very important thing in health in, in healthcare. And then we have something called kindness, which has its banal definitions, you know, the act of being friendly or generous, considerate. Compassionate is, is certainly something that, that is more profound. The other thing I think that's, that's important for us to remember is that the root of the word kindness is an old English word, which is exactly the same root as in my kind versus your kind. And that's a reminder that we act kindly to other people when we imagine that we could be them and they could be us. We see them as, as part of our group, our in-group or our tribe as, as, it, as it were. Now, the good news is that I don't have to teach you how to be empathic. You are hardwired to be empathic because evolution has given us brain cells that allow us to empathize with others. And, and you know, there are many ways that these get activated. One of them is in the birth period through an act called, or, or after the baby's born, through an act or, or a behavior known as behavioral synchronization or behavioral synchrony. And, and, and what you see there in that photo is a mother and a baby mimicking one another. They mimic their facial expressions, their eye movements, eventually their vocalizations and their words and their songs, and it looks like a pas de deux. And in fact, this is one of the roots of attachment. It's one of the reasons why we become attached to our children. There's also a kindness chemical called oxytocin, which, uh, get, which helps the mother give birth, also helps the mother give breast milk to her baby. And in fact, there are studies that have used a nasal spray consisting of oxytocin, the very same oxytocin hormone, to try to make sociopaths and psychopaths kinder and it does work to some extent. So that's the biology of, of, of uh, empathy. Keep in mind that empathy is always a choice. You know that the, the empathy I'm referring to that's baked into our brain cells is vanilla empathy. It's basic empathy. But above that we have our giant frontal lobes and we have something called executive function and empathy is always a choice. You're always weighing what are what, you know, I want to help this person, but if, if helping this person is going to take away from the resources of myself or my family, maybe I have to think twice. And, and the reason I mention this is that I think you need to cut yourself some slack if in, in, in one moment you're not as empathic as you could be, because there, are, there may be many competing reasons why you can't be empathic at that moment. So that's the biology of empathy, which is baked into our brain cells. So that's one tendency. The other tendency though, is a very different tendency. We also have baked into our primitive brains uh, cells that, that instantaneously, upon looking at somebody's face, their facial expressions, their words, the sound of their voice, the color of their skin, uh, it, it, it gives us this very basic ability or capacity to decide within a nanosecond or two whether another person whose face we're looking at is a friend or an enemy. And, and, you know, and in, in that moment, if we decide that they're a friend, then we will ascribe all, we will assume that they're kind, that they're empathic, that they're hardworking, that they're generous, that they're charitable, just like us, even if that isn't always necessarily true. And if we decide they're a member of the other tribe, uh, the out group, as, uh, as psychologists call it, we will assume they have the opposite, that they are our enemies, that they wanna kill us, that they're unkind, empathic, lazy, stingy, uncharitable, mean, aggressive, all of those things. Now, uh, you know, why would we be equipped with that kind of uh, primitive uh, you know, ability to, to distinguish between us and them because there was a time when we had enemies. There was, there was a time when the, the, the next set of enemies that wanted to kill us were on the next grassy knoll. And so it, 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 evolution, again, favored the ability to distinguish very quickly whether somebody might be friend or foe. However, we have laws today. We don't kill each other, at least we try not to. And, and as a result, in the big city, 
it's not helpful to, to kind of divide the world into us and them uh, so quickly without, without exercising some higher judgment in our executive function. And so the good news is we have these giant brains that not only keep us from being empathic at some times, but also take away or suppress that, that tendency to divide the world into us and them. So that's good. That, that allows us to survive, but there's a problem. That basic instinct returns when we are under stress because stress hormones suppress our executive function. And, and I would put to you that the United States right now is under a great deal of stress, a great deal of economic, social stresses, cultural stresses, economic stresses. There's food insecurity, there's, there's healthcare insecurity, there's job insecurity, there's housing insecurity. And there's, uh, you know, a fee and, and, and so it's, it's not surprising that somebody like a Donald Trump who knows how to exploit that, you know, uses imagery that, that constantly refers to people as the other. Liberals are the other to him. Uh, people who are trying to get in from, who are trying to, to enter the country from, from, from Mexico and Central America are the enemy. And, and, and so he uses that imagery and the fact that it's, and, and he's exploiting it, the fact that it's resonating tells you that their society is under stress. And we hope that, that as the COVID crisis passes, that, that, that they will return to ways where uh, they're under less stress, you know, more emphasis on, on providing opportunities for as many people as possible. And when, when the stress levels go down, hopefully they'll return to the kind selves that, that they are known for uh, throughout the world. So, you know, that's what's in our, our, our DNA, that's what's in our brain cells. There are system factors in healthcare that affect our ability to be empathic in the moment. And anybody who works in healthcare knows a lot about this. Inadequate staffing, uh, uh, time pressure. And, and, you know, people ask me, can you be empathic in five minutes? Yeah, you can be empathic in 30 seconds, as long as you're not distracted by some urgent thing that you're supposed to do. Oh, I didn't check that blood result. Oh, I didn't do this. Oh, I didn't do that. There's a phone call. There's this, there's that. When that happens, you've got somebody in front of you, all of those distractions, you could have all the time in the world, but those distractions make it difficult for you to be empathic with the person in front of you. Time pressure, stressors, uh, system bureaucracies, inefficiencies in our healthcare system. COVID-19 is a major stressor that is affecting all of those other factors. Complicated clients, uh, people who, who re are at or near the end of life, not infrequently have multiple medical problems that are hard to manage, symptoms that are hard to manage. You know, people who need the services of Paliaco might be included in those categories. And I can tell you that, that medicine, healthcare, the patients that we see are far more complex than they were when I started practicing medicine in the early 1980s. And there are other factors like focus on outcomes, uh, not people, uh, so that you may have competing interests that make it difficult for you to do the job that you want to do, uh, taking care of a patient when you have to take care of the bureaucracy as well. Uh, this is a slide that shows you the growing length of time average time to the first visit by a personal support worker. That was before COVID. If anything, by right now, the time to get a personal support worker has become much, much longer because of COVID, because of attrition due to COVID, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, and, and, you know, hats off to personal support workers uh, who, who have been working in long-term care, where, as we've already discussed, there have been excess coronavirus deaths uh, personal support workers are vastly underpaid, and that's one of the conclusions of the first wave, underappreciated and underpaid. And of course, there are income subsidies for them provided by the Quebec government, provided by the Ontario government, and they are necessary. They are essential if we want to maintain uh, uh, the supply of personal support workers. In British Columbia, they were the first province to restrict personal support workers from working at multiple care homes. This is something they did as a matter of course because they couldn't cobble together enough income by working at one long-term care facility. So they tended to do several gig jobs to, to be able to pay you know, the rent and, and support their families. Lack of personal uh, protective equipment or PPE meant PSWs were disproportionately contracted, uh, contracting COVID-19 and dying of it. That's two in the bottom uh, portion of the, uh, of the slide, two uh, personal support workers who gave their lives 
to take care of people with COVID-19 who are living in long-term care. And, and that's something that, that I think we can all agree should not have happened. Uh, again, here's a survey of personal support workers before COVID-19, 79% were happy with their work, were unhappy with their jobs, 39% cited staffing issues, 26% cited low wages, 11% uh, uh, cited long and unpredictable hours. There were high burnout rates leading to absenteeism and quitting, and that was before COVID-19. What do you think it is now? Uh, I think if anything, it would be worse. Uh, I want to uh, talk to you about one woman who understands the needs of unpaid caregivers like my late father when he was looking after my mother, my sister looking after my parents. And her name is Donna Thompson, who wrote a lovely book, The Unexpected Journey of Caring, The Transformation from Loved One to Caregiver, which you know I certainly know a lot about, not just the book, but the personal experience. Donna has been an unpaid caregiver three times in her life in her adult life, well, her son Nicholas at the time was when she was looking after her late father. Then uh, her son Nicholas, uh, who had extraordinary needs and is now living in long-term care. Her mother Marjorie Higginson for recently, and that's what led to the book. And when she was on White Coat Black Art, she said to us, the type of nursing that families are expected to take on today is unprecedented. And there is no upper limit to what families will be expected to do in cases of complex care. And by complex care, I mean uh, children or uh, adults living at home with uh, multiple medical problems. They may have multiple devices that the family needs to learn how to operate. These would include uh, uh, G-tubes for feeding, uh, uh, CPAP machines, oxygen delivery devices, oxygen saturation monitors, blood pressure monitors, and, and IV pumps in some cases, and I can certainly go on and on and on about that. When you talk to caregivers, and I assume that, that many of the people who are, are, have, have come to this event today are caregivers uh, in one form or another, you're suffering from stress and you may have burnout and not know it. And, not know it. and, and, you know, and that's because caring for a loved one with multiple medical needs is stressful, I can tell you that caring for a loved one with dementia is, is as stressful as, as, as a caregiving role can be. Uh, and 20, it leads to a 23% higher level of stress hormones if you actually measure the cortisol in their, in their system with a saliva test, 15% lower level of antibody responses. So that means that, that they are at higher risk of contracting cancer themselves. They're at higher risk of, of having infections and succumbing to infections like influenza and pneumonia as a direct result. Elevated stress hormones can also lead to high blood pressure and diabetes and lower immune responses, as I've already said, increases susceptibility to cancer and to infections. Uh, this is uh, somebody you've probably heard of, Samir Sinha. She's a geriatrician at Sinai Health System in Toronto and University Health Network, which is across the street, also in downtown Toronto. He's the architect of the proposed national senior strategy and he told us on White Coat Black Heart last fall, we're already paying the costs of not actually meeting the needs of caregivers. And those costs are only going to increase on a massive scale unless we become more proactive now. He says the most acute caregiver needs are financial support and respite care so that, uh, so that you can take a night off once in a while. Because as you know, the, the duties seldom end. And this was before COVID-19. Uh, before uh, you had to uh, consider the possibility that you'd have to get up in, into uh, personal protective equipment and wash your hands thoroughly and, and pass a skills, skills testing uh, question or a skills test to be permitted to demonstrate that you're enough of an essential family caregiver that they won't ban you as a visitor uh, from coming to visit your loved one in long-term care. Uh, there are many curveballs, and one of them is cancer. Uh, an estimated 220,000 plus uh, cancer diagnoses in this country uh, in 2019 and 82,000 deaths in Canada occurring in the year 2019. The numbers are going up steadily. Uh, and the cancers that are most common would be lung, colorectal, breast, prostate cancer. They account for half of all cancer diagnoses and deaths in 2019. By 2036, one in four Canadians will be age 65 and older, and cancer is 11 times more likely in that age group. So it's something that, that, that 
that we will be seeing more and more and more in the years ahead. Uh, the other uh, great curveball, or one of the other great curveballs, if you can call it that, it's funny how, you know, I'm calling it a curveball, and yet it's the natural end of all life on this planet. Nobody lives forever. And yet, for many of us, it's a curveball because we put off uh, as for as long as possible any kind of thinking or reflection or contemplation about it, whether it's making our own needs known or trying to figure out the needs of loved ones uh, who we're taking care of. And uh, this uh, slide shows uh, the number of medically assisted deaths. You know, it's not something that I want to talk about at length, but I do want to say that that certainly prior to COVID, it, it, it existed. Uh, the number of medically assisted deaths in Canada between January 1st uh, and October the 31st, um, in uh, not including Quebec, Northwest Territories, Yukon, and, and et cetera, and Nunavut were 2,614 deaths. And, and uh, the number of, of medically assisted deaths in Quebec between December 10th, 2015 and March 31st, 2018 was 1,664. Uh, and, and, you know, and that is out of a total of 6,749 medically assisted deaths in Canada since the legislative enactment, which was December 10th, 2015. The reason why I'm mentioning this is to simply say that, that it is considered an option in the province of Quebec. And in fact, you could argue that the province of Quebec probably did more to drive the national discussion on medical assistance in dying than, uh, than people living in any other province. And that's the reason why I wanted to mention that because it is an end of life issue. Uh, and uh, as I've said, more and more Canadians are using it as an option. Tim Regan was one of them. Tim Regan witnessed his aunt's painful death in hospital uh, many years ago when doctors refused to remove her intravenous. He saw his father-in-law force fed, that was his description and put into active care, meaning you know, as if, as if trying to save it, uh, his life on the last day of his life. Uh, and as a result, he underwent a major operation on the last day of his life and suffered post-operative pain as a result. And, and, and as a result, looking at that, he decided he would never go through the same thing himself. He was diagnosed with an operable liver cancer in the summer of 2017. Uh, and uh, in December of 2017, I came to his house in Toronto and I was privileged to witness his medical uh, assistance, his medically assisted death, um, and by Dr. Sandy Buckman, who uh, re was recently, most recently, the president of the Canadian Medical Association. And, you know, he said, among many things, I'm going out with my boots on. And it was, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing to watch. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I've come to the conclusion that, that it's the prerogative of people to decide when and how um, they want their lives to end, and and you know the fact is it is the law of the land, and uh, although there are some propositions to change that law, as, as is worth discussing for just a moment, and that's because again Quebec is driving those changes. You probably uh, know the 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 lawsuit by by Jean Truchon and Nicole Gladu. They launched a court challenge to the Medical Aid and Dying Act. Uh, in 2019, seeking access to Quebec and Canada's doctor-assisted dying laws. Both suffer from neurodegenerative diseases that they say cause persistent and intolerable suffering. And in September 2019, the Quebec Superior Court Justice declared parts of both the federal and provincial laws on made unconstitutional because they're too restrictive. And, and you know, stay tuned. There, there will be refinements. We know that the government has had consultations on, on altering the laws to include mental health disorders among the list of disorders that might be included as, as, as causing uh, uh, needless suffering, uh, but stay tuned on those because this is a situation that's very much in flux. Um, I don't wanna forget, you know, because you know, if, you're, if you're thinking that, that, you know, that, that all we have talked about in the last three or four years is, is medical aid and dying, you know, I, think there, I think you have a point. And, and I don't think we've talked enough about uh, the lack of palliative care services in, in this country. Uh, in June 2010, Senator Sharon Carstairs published her final report on the future of palliative care in Canada. And she made the point that 70, that 90% that of Canadians will reach a stage in their lives when they would benefit from palliative care and 70% would not receive it. 
And, and she said that that is, and certainly has been echoed by many other people, including me, um, what, what we must do uh, is celebrate death as we do birth and, and provide good palliative care. And, and the other reason, I guess, for mentioning uh, medical aid and dying and palliative care kind of back to back is to remind me to remind you that while some people believe that it's kind of an either or, you're either in favor of palliative care or you're in favor of medical aid and dying, that that is an absurdity. It's a, it's a, it's a non sequitur, it's a false dichotomy. It is not necessary to, to sacrifice palliative care to have good, you know, to have medical aid and dying and, and you, you don't have to um, you know, say that you're not in favor of medical aid and dying in order to have good palliative care. There's no reason why we can't have both in this country. And in fact, most jurisdictions uh, that brought medical aid and dying first, including the Netherlands and Belgium, if you look at their palliative care services, they did not go down after medical aid and dying was enacted, they went up. And, and, and in fact, you know, it, 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 there are some myths about palliative care, which we're going to talk about in just the next few minutes, but this is that this would be the big myth that somehow it's one or the other. It's not, it's both. Uh, I do want to talk about some of the myths. This is from North York General Hospital, 10 myths that the Canadian public has about palliative care. The first one, the palliative care is most appropriate for patients who will likely die within weeks. In fact, palliative care is often described as supportive care or symptom management. And there is no reason why good palliative care can't be instituted at the outset of a diagnosis of cancer. It is not necessary that it only be brought in in the last few days or, or weeks of life. Myth number two, pain is part of dying. Fact, pain is not always part of dying. In fact, most pain can be well controlled with good palliative care right to the end of life. Myth number three, treatment stops when palliative care starts. No. Um, you, can, you can treat. Uh, in fact, palliative care can begin at the time of diagnosis of a life-limiting disease, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about palliative radiation or palliative uh, uh, surgery or chemotherapy uh, in a few moments uh, because it became personally pertinent in my family. Myth number four, palliative care speeds up the process of dying. Fact, palliative care does not speed up the process of dying. It provides comfort. It provides better quality of life, and in that way, uh, might actually extend life. Myth number five, raising the topic of palliative care with patients and, and caregivers robs them of hope. The fact is palliative care ensures the best quality of care. In fact, we want patients, it, 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 perhaps it's the way that we've been, we've been framing it and marketing it. And there are people who believe that palliative care needs to be marketed in a different way, but certainly, you know, it doesn't rob people of hope. Uh, you know, the answer to that is every one of us will die at one point. Uh, in our lives, uh, our lives will come to an end. And it's, it, I, I suppose one of the differences is that people with a life limiting illness know, uh, might have a greater sense of when, uh, within a range, when that's likely to happen. Taking pain medications in palliative care leads to addiction. No, it doesn't. And I think that, I, I don't think a lot of people believe that these days. More myths. Palliative care is only provided in hospital. The fact is in many cases, palliative care can be provided where the patient lives at home, in a hospice, in hospital, or in a long-term care facility. Um, I have to move my slide, my picture so I can actually see. Morphine is given to speed up the process of dying. Not completely a myth, but you know, certainly appropriate doses of morphine keep patients comfortable, but do not um, speed up the process of dying. The only time that happens is when a patient has intractable pain that, that cannot be remedied with opioids. But as I said, that is seldom the case. Myth number nine, palliative care is only for people dying of cancer. In fact, palliative care can benefit anybody uh, who has symptoms that need to be managed, including people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, chronic congestive heart failure, kidney disease, et cetera. And then the 10th myth, people in palliative care who stop eating die of starvation. In fact, people with advanced illnesses don't experience hunger or thirst. Uh, as healthy people do, people who stop eating die of their illness, not of starvation. We certainly heard about that from Catherine Mannix, uh, who is a palliative care, retired palliative care physician who was on our program on White Coat Black Art during the fall. Now I want to get personal and tell you about a story. This is the story of my late father-in-law, Gabriel. Uh, and, and Gabe was a robust man uh, who... Um, 
um, operated a fabric center in Winnipeg, uh, made uh, Aliyah, went to Israel, lived there for 10 years, worked on a, on a you know, uh, worked on a farm, uh, came back with his family to Canada in the late 1980s and, and uh, worked at various jobs until he retired and was enjoying his, his retirement when unfortunately he developed the first symptoms of dementia. Uh, and and uh, we certainly watched, you know, that photo on the bottom right, that's, that's Gabe. Um, he, he had dementia at that time. Uh, there's my partner Tamara and our son, uh, Alex. Uh, and, and, and it's hard to watch, um, you know, having watched my mother now watching my father-in-law, that was certainly a sad time in our lives. And he deteriorated, he lost the ability to ambulate. Um, he, you know, that, you know, that was after a period when he would wander, he became aggressive at home. And, and eventually um, it became harder and harder for my mother-in-law Phyllis to look after uh, you know, my father-in-law at home and eventually she made the heart-wrenching decision to have him placed in a long-term care facility in North Toronto. Uh, and there he was for a couple of years. And then um, something really bad happened, as if, as if he didn't have enough bad things happen to him. Um, he developed a lump uh, on the left side of his face, beside his nose, and it was biopsied, and it turned out to be a rare invasive sweat gland tumor, an apocrine gland carcinoma on his face, he was assessed by an oncologist. A surgery was not recommended. The prognosis that was given to the family was three to six months. Now he was offered palliative radiotherapy, uh, but that was not accepted by my mother-in-law, the substitute decision maker, so as not to prolong his life and therefore his suffering. And and you know we tried to to argue with her the the idea that palliative radiotherapy was not to extend his life, but to improve the quality of his life. That lesion was at constant caused him constant pain. It was at constant risk of bleeding. We were always afraid that it might eat into an artery and cause a sudden kind of catastrophic uh, blood loss and death. Um, but but the, like a lot of other families, my wife's family had difficulty grasping the concept of palliative treatment. And, and, and that's the reason why I wanted to flag that for you. Uh, in May of 2016, the pain was slowly increasing and my, my father-in-law's function was slowly decreasing. And so at that point in the long-term care facility, there was a palliative care consult and he was started on hydromorphone uh, Dilaudid, which is a powerful opioid pain reliever, PRN. And that's a, a mistake. A PRN uh, administration can lead to rapid accumulation if it's given too frequently. Uh, and the fact that he had dementia meant that it was difficult to get a handle on how much pain he was having. He was in distress for many different reasons, not just pain. But every time he appeared to be in distress, it was assumed it was pain. He was given another dose of hydromorphone, and uh, and uh, you know he then he developed tumor-related pain plus back and leg pain that led to round-the-clock opioids in addition to the PRNs, and then we came to a crisis. He had a dramatically decreased level of awareness. He had myoclonic jerks uh, like that, and that was caused by morphine excess, uh, and uh, you know it came to a crisis. There was disagreement in the family. Do we hold the opioids uh, and have him return to baseline, do, or do we continue around the clock even until unto death? And, and this was actually the discussion in the family. Eventually, the decision was made to hold the opioids, uh, and his level of awareness improved to his baseline. Of course, he was complaining of pain. Um, at that point, um, they did a slower titration of his of his pain medication. But, but it was believed that he was weeks away from, uh, from dying. Um, and, and so the opioids were restarted. There was more careful obser uh, observation and, and he was okay for a while. Then there was another rapid deterioration in his activities of daily living. He went from self-feeding to spoon feeding. So he had to be fed. He was coughing a lot during and after feeding, which of course raised the specter that he was aspirating is his food and, and that's what happened to my late mother. When that happens, um, it's the end. It's, you know, you can, you can, you can give the person a, a, a tube feeding, um, but that doesn't do as much good at preventing aspiration as we would think or hope. Uh, and on June the 19th of 2016, he developed acute cyanosis and respiratory distress and the on-call palliative care team ordered a pain pump uh, but the nurse at the long-term care facility was unable to set it up. So what should we do? 
Um, and, and, you know, as substitute decision maker, it was up to my mother-in-law to try to figure out and for all of us to support, him, to support her, to answer the question, what would Gabe want? And, and there was a significant factor there. And I kind of jumped to the, to the next slide too quickly. Um, you know, it's interesting. I don't know why that's happening. Okay, there we go. Wow. Um, I need to be able to go backwards. There we go. Sorry about that. What would Gabe want? Well, it turns out that that episode in June of 2016 was exactly a week before his uh, eldest granddaughter was going to be getting married. And, you know, at this point, Gabe wouldn't have been able to reason. He was very, very ill at this time. It was basically either transfer him to hospital or watch him die over the next day. And we kind of figured, you know, knowing Gabe, you know, uh, for many, many years, uh, you know, his wife knew him for close to 60 years. Um, you know, his kids knew them that long and, and a little bit less. Um, they figured that Gabe would want the show to go on. They would want, they would not want, that he would not want his death to interfere with, with his granddaughter's wedding. It would have, it would have launched a funeral, Shiva, uh, a period of mourning that would have made it very difficult to celebrate during that wedding. And, and, and so the decision was made to, to transfer him to hospital where he was given intravenous fluids because he was coughing. They put him on antibiotics. I don't know if they helped. And they started opioid pain relievers again uh, carefully, except now by intravenous drip instead of uh, through uh, uh, oral doses. And he stabilized in hospital prior to the wedding. The wedding went off without a hitch. Uh, he was transferred to palliative care um, after the wedding, a couple of days after the wedding, and he passed away at that point. But I can tell you, even then, in the last day or two, there were more good times than bad times. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's what happened. Um, you know, I know some people might disagree with the decisions that were made, but one of the things I learned from that situation is just how situational ethics and decision making can be. And, and you have to be prepared to adjust depending on the circumstances. If anybody wants to ask me questions about that, I'll be happy to answer those. I told you I went on a search uh, to find out whether I was still the empathic person that I was born to be. And as part of that, uh, I went to Quebec City to meet Professor Phil Jackson um, from Laval University, who did a functional MRI of my brain to see if I had the brain circuitry uh, of, of somebody who has empathy, because I, I already told you that empathy is inside the brain. And in fact, he found out that I do. I do have the circuitry for empathy, but like a lot of other health professionals in mid-career, um, I have an underactive empathy center um, and, and in one experimental model. If I look at the face of somebody in distress or pain, like a lot of other veteran emergency physicians and nurses, I tend to underestimate the pain of my patients. Does it mean I'm unempathic? No, they don't know why this exists. This is a new finding that has been replicated in a number of experiments. And you can think that there might be a number of reasons why that would be the case. You know, for one thing, you know, maybe when I look at the face of one person with pain or distress, I'm comparing that person to 10,000 other people I've seen. Or maybe I, uh, you know, I'm thinking that I was scammed by somebody who was pretending to be in pain last week and they, they forged prescriptions in my name for an opioid. I know we have an opioid crisis, so I have some doubt. Or maybe that opioid crisis is making me think I can't give people the opioids that I used to because we have this opioid crisis. That's going to give me something called moral distress when the rules and conventions don't allow you to do what your heart tells you you want to do. And so maybe if I underestimate the pain uh, on that person's face, that will, that will kind of preempt my moral distress at not giving them adequate pain relief. Um, but, you know, seeing that, seeing that, you know, that, that the empathy centers of my brain didn't light up as strongly as it would uh, a, a non-health professional looking at the same faces made me feel ashamed of myself. And that's an important point because it turns out if you read the books of Brene Brown, and I do, shame, the feeling of toxic shame, the feeling of unworthiness, that I don't belong with the group, that I deserve to be excluded from the group because I'm utterly irredeemable. That's what I mean by toxic shame, not guilt. Guilt is about, I did something bad and it makes you want to fix it, repair it. You know, I know I'm not bad, I did something bad. When you feel shame, you think I am bad. 
And, and the important thing about shame is that it blocks the ability to empathize with other people because you are so wrapped up in not having other people discover what it is that makes you so shameful that you can't pay attention to them. So just like the anxious person who doesn't know what to say at a funeral or at a shiva, you know, and, and so we give them stock phrases like sorry for your loss, somebody who's in the grip of toxic shame can't empathize with other people. Well, fortunately for me, there's a remedy for shame and that is talking about the things you feel ashamed of. And, and in fact, you know, I started off this, this speech by talking about um, a shameful time in my career when I was accused of unkindness by a family. Well, the good news about talking about things that you're ashamed of is that it deprives the, the, you know, the thing that you're ashamed of, of the ability to enslave you or the ability to, to make you feel trapped. Uh, silence is the culture medium in which shame flourishes. If you talk about the things you're ashamed of, then it, it deprives that episode of the oxygen that's necessary to perpetuate the shame. So I, you know, I did a TED talk about my worst mistakes. I'm talking to you about a time when I was accused of unkindness. And, 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 and now I empathize with other people who feel the same way in healthcare, whether they've made a mistake or have been accused of unkindness as I was. So I, I promised you, um, these are some things that you can do to take care of yourself so that you are, you're paving the way to be more empathic to other people. And these are things that, that, you, can that you can adopt immediately that will make you a kinder person today. Uh, the first one is, is this, you cannot take care of other people until you learn how to take care of yourself. That's, that is absolutely essential. So get enough exercise, go for walks, enjoy nature, get enough sleep, as much as you can. I know that under COVID, a lot of people are having trouble sleeping. Eat a good diet. That means with healthy foods, not just uh, sugar, salt, and fats. They're all important in your diet, but not. But don't make them your your main, the main part of your diet. Eat a healthy diet. You know, this morning I ran 10 kilometers. I run 10 kilometers three times a week, and I have discovered that without that, I I can't function. I I would. I would go mad in COVID-19 if I didn't have access to exercise. Other things that you should do, um, emotionally take care of yourself. Um, be, instead of ruminating, instead of living in either the worried future where you're terrified about all the bad things that are gonna happen, or you're looking back um, you know, with regret thinking that was a foolish thing. Why did I do that? Why did I do this? If you find yourself saying that, just remind yourself that you can only live in one moment. And that is right now where you and I are right now. And, you know, later on when you're with your families, when this, when this uh, presentation ends and you've asked all of your questions, try to live in the moment. And there are many ways to do that. One of them is to enjoy nature. One of them is to breathe. And I do breathing exercises. I do box breathing where I breathe into a count of, of six. And then I hold my breath for a count of six and then let the breath out for a count of six. So it's kind of in the shape of a box. That's why they call it box breathing. When you get bored with six, 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 I do seven, 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 eight, eight, eight. And sometimes I'll do 20, 20, 20. Um, and, and, and when you do that, you breathe deeply, you flatten out your diaphragms, you air out your lungs and you feel better. Uh, and there are many ways to do, to do breathing. There's many ways to do mindfulness. There's meditation. There's, there's many ways of doing this. Practicing gratitude forcing yourself to notice the things that you are grateful for. Notice those sweet moments in life when, you know, your two kids are getting along or, or, or a moment when, when you have a, 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 a loved one who has cancer and is dying, but has enjoyed a laugh. You know, don't think about, for a moment, don't think about oh, what do I do next week? What do I do if they don't laugh ever again? Enjoy the fact that they're laughing at that moment that they've enjoyed that. Other things that you're going to do, you cannot forgive other people unless you forgive yourself. You can't be compassionate to other people unless you are compassionate to yourself first. And you cannot be kind to other people unless you learn how to be kind to yourself. And, and you know, life is like an airplane. You have to put on your own oxygen mask before you render assistance and put on the oxygen, help other people put on their oxygen mask. That's the same concept right there. So, so that's how you take care of yourself. When you take care of yourself, Anything is possible. Now you can start to create a kinder system. And I just want to close out with a couple of slides that tell you uh, about some of the ways that the system can be kinder for people at or near the end of life. 
And the first one is something called Cancer Coaches. This is something that I experienced uh, at the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation, not that far from where you are right now. It was pioneered in Canada and in other countries. And, and uh, the way it works is that cancer patients and family members are paired with a trained cancer coach. Now, most of these cancer coaches have prior healthcare backgrounds, physiotherapists, di registered dietitians, nurses, nurse practitioners, et cetera. And what they do is help clients manage stress, get back to work, um, figure out how they want to use the time they have left, help them through those rough transitions. And they are solution focused, which means they never tell you what to do. They, they simply listen to you and ask you questions like, um, what would you like to do? Or, or what do you see going on with your life right now? What else do you see? What's the evidence for what you have to see? What, you, what might you do about that? And, 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 and what they're doing is not talking a lot. They're listening and paraphrasing what the person is saying. And, and in that, they are helping the person, the client, pull solutions out of themselves. It's often solutions that they never, they never thought about before. Uh, and in Ottawa, it's 10 hours free of charge provided to clients. You know, obviously, it's a program that could be under financial stress, especially during COVID-19. But that's one thing I wanted to tell you about. And I'm going to close out. Well, wait a second. Before I do, uh, this just shows you uh, a couple of clients that I met. Uh, Jocelyn Lico had breast cancer, and she was helped by Bonnie Elliott to deal with medication side effects and to help her family adjust post-treatment because they tended to want to do everything for her instead of letting her resume her life. That's, Jonathan, that's Jocelyn Lico at the top. Then there's the late Chris Moore who had uh, glioblastoma multiforme, GBM, one of the worst cancers that, that there is. And Nasser Yassin helped him return to work following his initial treatment for GBM. He helped him when he had a recurrence transition to retirement and he helped him prioritize his time during his pre-terminal phase. And, and that is Chris Moore with his family when I got to meet them. So that, those are two clients who were helped by cancer coaches. I'm gonna close out with one, one scene that's a little bit more recent, uh, and that is community paramedics doing palliative care. I encountered this in the Ottawa Valley in the county of Renfrew, 140,000 people or so live there. Uh, this is in and around Ottawa. Uh, close to Algonquin Park in Northern Ontario. It includes some indigenous communities as well. And beginning in April, 2020, paramedics like Matt Roussel, who you see wearing the PPE, uh, were providing palliative care to clients like Billy Hobbs, who you see uh, in the hospital bed in the living room of her home and her daughter, Susan. And, and Billy did not have cancer. She had end-stage congestive heart failure. And, and uh, she, basically, Matt was there to provide medications, to replenish them as necessary, and to teach Susan how to administer them and how to provide self-care, how to turn her, uh, and how to do other aspects of increasingly onerous self-care, and was there to provide emotional support to both of them. This is a program that I think is, is remarkable. It's something that I, I, I think we can see uh, brought to, to, you know, there's no reason why it can't be brought to other parts in Canada. Uh, what you're getting here is a sneak peek of something that we will have on White Coat Black Art in the weeks and months to come. But I wanted you to have a look at that to know that that exists as well. I just wanna close out by saying that I've really enjoyed speaking to you. I look forward to your questions right now. And I also wanted to say once again, that, that we are in this together. This is a, a terrible time in the history of Canada and the history of, of the peoples of the world. Let's pull together, keep remembering to be as kind as we can to other people while taking care of ourselves. And hopefully it's not an either or, but both. And I wanna thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. That was a fabulous presentation. And um, we now have some um, questions. If you could um, answer them for us. Can, can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. <laughs> I just can, I, do you want me to stop sharing my slides now? Sure, that'd be great. Now where is, oh, I gotta pull that button. Now there we go, and that way you can just see me. Okay. There you go. And so our first question is, um, how has the pandemic taken, um, how, how has it affected you both emotionally and physically? 
um, the, the pandemic has affected me um, emotionally and physically in a number of different ways. Um, first of all, uh, you know, on a very mundane level, we're taking exquisite care of patients in hospital and we're taking exquisite care not to spread COVID in the hospital. And so I, I wear, I'm in and out of personal protective equipment all shift long. I wear a mask constantly. Uh, when I go into a room of a patient who has any of the sentinel symptoms suggestive of, 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 of COVID-19, um, I, I have to wear a gown, I have to wear a mask and a face shield. Um, it's, it's hot, it's debilitating, it adds time. You know, anytime I go into a room uh, to see a patient with potential COVID-19, uh, if I step out and, and say, oh, I forgot something or I forgot to do something, I have to go back in there, put on the getup again. So that is exhausting. Um, it's not fun to have to do. And, and certainly I remember SARS 10 years ago uh, and it was not 10 years ago, it was, sorry, 18 years ago, uh, 17 years ago. And, and, um, and it seems that SARS came and went in a much shorter period of time. So this is much longer. So that, 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 that's, that, that's one thing. Um, I'm also aware that uh, I'm not as young as I was during the last time we had a coronavirus around. And so I am personally concerned, anxious, that if I were to get COVID-19, um, I, I might get really sick. And one of the reasons why I run is, is to try to keep myself as healthy as possible. And, 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 you know, I can tell you like a lot of other health professionals, uh, I made sure that I had an updated will and an updated uh, power of attorney uh, should something happen to me uh, because as a direct result of COVID-19 and I'm, and I'm not alone when it comes to that. Having said that, th so those are some of the, you know, those are some of the, those are some of the kind of challenging things. Uh, I remember one of the first times during the first wave, I was working with a colleague of mine named Paul Koblitz, who's about half my age. And uh, he, I was doing a night shift and he was doing the shift before me, which started. So my night shift started at 11 p.m. and his shift started at 9 p.m. and was supposed to go till 4 a.m. And he said to me, Brian, if you don't mind, I would like to do your intubations. He said that if you have a patient who comes in who needs to be placed on a ventilator, because this is the highest risk thing that we've got, that we do. It's called a protected code blue. We wear a special gown, two sets of gloves, the N95 mask, a much larger face shield. And the reason why we do all that, we have these very exacting procedures for donning and doffing and for the procedures inside the room, is that that's the moment when I might be, all of us in that room are at highest risk of contracting COVID because there's if we do anything that allows more of the COVID germs to be aerosolized, uh, and, and if there's a breach in our equipment and our personal protective equipment, we might inhale that or have some of that path, you know, enter our nose and our eyes or our mouth and give us COVID-19. Well, he said, I'm prepared to stay all night and do all of your intubations so you don't have to. And I kind of got a lump in my throat when he said that. It was the kindest thing. It was the most amazingly kind thing that a colleague could, could, could offer for me. And, and it's something that I haven't forgotten. It's something that, that, that keeps me warm, renews my faith in healthcare. And I've certainly seen a lot of sacrifice on the part of healthcare workers, whether it's personal support workers or my colleagues who've gone into long-term care to help spell off personal support workers and nurses. So there's been a lot of kindness here, but that's how it's affected me, you know, from the yin and yang of it, from the negative stuff to the positive stuff. Okay, thank you very much. And um, our second question, um, here is our second question. As a caregiver overwhelmed with responsibilities, how do I concretely cultivate kindness and compassion? Oh, that is such a, that is such a good question. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, will, I will say that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna say two things about this. You know, the rules are also the same for the, the same for you as they are for anybody who, who isn't under the stress that you're under right now. It sounds like you're under a, a terrible degree of stress. Um, there is even more of a need on your part to take care of yourself as much as you can through uh, you know, eating right as much as you can, trying to, to, to exercise if you can, and, and if you, and, and 
if I can anticipate, if you tell me, but I don't have any time to do that. Um, my response to that would be, my heart goes out to you. But that's where, you know, that's why when you look at surveys of people uh, who provide essential care for loved ones, they want two things. They want some kind of financial support because a lot of them need to work or can't or need to buy extras that they can't, that they can't, that, that they can't afford. Um, and the other thing they need is respite care. So, so if you have access to, to respite care, great. You know, if, 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 you, if, you, if you don't, then I would as much as possible lean on your family, ask family and even friends if they can give you a few hours. Um, you know, I know that, that my friend and colleague Jennifer Jilts in Ontario, in Northern Ontario, uh, in uh, Smith Falls, close to Ottawa, um, belongs to a volunteer group that provides respite care for people, companionship, just anything to, to give somebody a few hours off so that they can, they can do normal things like shop or walk or take care of themselves, which are even harder to do these days during COVID-19. But, but lean on whoever you can and whatever support services that you can get a hold of because you've got to get your stress level down. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to say is that, is that it's not either or. Either I'm... I, I get my stress levels down so I can be kind and empathic to others or my stress level is so high that I can't possibly be kind and empathic to others. The reason why it's not, either, it's one of those, it's a false dichotomy. The reason why it's a false dichotomy is this. When you are unkind to somebody else for whatever good reason, like being under stress, there is no part of your brain, your heart, your soul that says, okay, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to let you off the hook for that one. And we're going to let your body and your emotional state be off the hook because you're under stress. In fact, anytime you're unkind to somebody else, the other person's heart rate and blood pressure go up. So do yours. And so, and, and the opposite is true. When you're kind to another person under those circumstances, what happens is that your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down and your emotional distress goes down. So, 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 and, you know, that's the argument for more kindness and empathy in the world. And, uh, and so, um, you know, you know, find a way to deal with the stress, lean on the people who might be able to support you and be as kind as you can. And, and when all else fails, seek out other people who are going through what you're going through and, and be a source of inspiration to them. Because if you can do that, you will feel better, even though you're under stress. I hope that helps you and I, I wish you the best. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. And I would just suggest to that person um, that uh, you can always call Paliaco and we are a presence to help uh, in, in your situation. Okay, so our third question is, could you talk more about the statistic of 2010 indicating that 70% of the people won't receive palliative care. Is it still 70% in 2020? Yes, it is, unfortunately. It is still along those lines. Some money has been put into palliative care. Some services are available. And anecdotally, some people are getting better palliative care. But we have a healthcare system that is under constant stress. And, and while some improvements can be made from time to time, you never know when services and budgets are going to be cut. We do know that during COVID-19, there have been challenges delivering palliative care. Uh, so, so, you know, part of the problem is that we don't have enough palliative care physicians. We don't have enough um, uh, palliative care nurses. Um, to start, and, and that's one of the drivers for, for increasing the, the, the number of community paramedics. These are trained paramedics who spend part of their time acting as community paramedics, meaning that they don't work with lights and sirens. They work in specially equipped vehicles and they're specially trained. Uh, the fact that, that in Renfrew County, the, 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 the head of, um, of paramedic services said, let's do this was a tacit acknowledgement that they that the family physicians there, as good as they are, were not able to provide adequate palliative care to the people who live in Renfrew County.
Can't hear you. Okay, how's that? Better. <laughs> um, let me see. Okay. Um, considering your experience with your father-in-law, could you talk more about the family disagreements, decisions you had to take together? What is important to keep in mind in these difficult moments? That's a really good question. Good question. It's, it's a fantastic question. Um, it's, 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 you know, the, 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 I guess the first thing is that the more you know, there's a blessing to having to having lots of extended family. You know, if there are a lot of children, uh, adult children, with opinions, um, there might be uh, there might be sons-in-law, daughters, daughters-in-law. The more you know, strong opinions you have, the the more you you have a a, a tendency to have disagreements, and they are, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, part of life. People have different philosophies. People have different politics. Uh, some people, you know, in, in the case in the in the case of my father-in-law, there there was a practical streak that said, um, "Why are we prolonging his suffering?" And you could make that argument. Uh, and 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 on the other hand, you know, the the. You know why do people want the 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 right to to uh, to medical aid in dying? They want that because they want to be able to decide for themselves when when the quality when they when they see no future improvement in their quality of life or that their quality of life will continue to deteriorate. And the way the law is set up, they have to make a decision when they're competent. They can only agree to it when they're competent, which means they know by definition they will be depriving themselves of hours, days, weeks, or even months of, of reasonable quality of life because they are not allowed under the present law to, to request medical aid in dying or to have medical aid in dying uh, unless they are competent to refuse. You can see, you can see some of the issues that are that 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 may be going on. So in my father-in-law's family, there were people that said you shouldn't hasten things, and there are people who said you should. Um, the important thing is that the family disagreements should not be surrounding what the what the what the relatives want. It's about what the person wants, and so. The very definition of being a substitute decision maker, having what we call power of attorney in many parts of, of Canada and the world, is, is that um, you are acting as if you are the person. What would they want? And that's why I put in very specific wording, what would Gabe want? Because, you know, like he, you know, he, he could have thought, ah, I've had it, I want to die. But if he were told, if, if we can keep you alive and relatively comfortable for a few more days and they could get past the wedding, what would you think of that? So that, that actually was an act of empathy to think about what he would have been thinking if, he, if he'd been in his mind. Now, as I've said, he'd been capable of answering for himself at that, at that time. So, so, so you know, I've, I've, I've kind of been meandering a little bit, but the answer that I want to leave you with is, is this. When you sit down as a family to have that conversation, empathize with everybody in the room. Don't get in. I mean, these are emotional arguments. And, and it's very easy to have people become emotionally upset and, and to raise their voices. But what, what you want to try to do is empathize with one another. And, have, and even though they might disagree, have everybody agree with one thing, that they have the best interests of their loved one at heart. And that way, even when they do disagree, at least they're agreeing on one thing. And, and, and so that's a very important attitude to have. And then the other really, really important thing is for the person who actually has the signed authority, that they are not just acting, that they are able to put aside their own distress. You know, if this is a spouse and they're thinking, this is gonna be the first time in my life I've been alone since I've been married. Um, you know, they need to think about they, at some point, they need to stop thinking about their own needs and think about the needs of their loved one. And, and, and because that's the very essence of being a power of attorney, being a substitute decision maker. I hope that helps. Thank you, Brian. Okay, our next question is, 
Um, in Quebec, people died alone because due to COVID risks and restrictions, family members were not allowed to be with their loved ones at the time of passing. What is your view on that from an empathy kindness perspective? It's a loaded question. And, and I, you know, I, I, I have a very strong opinion about that. Um, uh, I think if that happens, if it happened, it was reprehensible. I think it's awful. Uh, I think there's no reason why, why, why that has happened. Um, we have enough on our plates with the fact that, you know, we know, you know, loved ones who've died in other provinces, who've, who've died in, uh, in, you know, in the United States. Uh, you know, I know somebody who lost his mother. He was in Toronto. His mother uh, lives, uh, lived in England, died in England, in, in the UK. And, and because, of, because of travel restrictions over which, over which we would have no control under certain circumstances, um, that's bad enough uh, that, that they were restricted from being there and now and, and, and could not uh, you know, even hold, you know, people can't hold a funeral. They, they, they couldn't even, even go there and have, and have a, a celebration of life in, 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 in person. So to have somebody dying alone in Ontario or Quebec province or, 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 or anywhere else where the, where the loved ones are here in, you know, locally nearby and aren't allowed to be with them, I think is, is reprehensible. And, and from an empathic, from an empathy point of view, it just shows total lack of empathy. Um, I can also tell you that, that rules aside, you know, that whenever you have these rules, you know, we're talking about contact tracing, we're talking about slapping rules on that say you have to wear a mask. Rules are only good as, as good as enforcement. And you probably have heard of, as I have certainly heard of, circumstances where hospitals permitted visitors and even a greater number of visitors than might have been uh, allowed under the regulations or under the rules. And yet they, they still did it because they made independent decisions that, that it was not an empathic thing to do to deprive loved ones of an opportunity, a last opportunity to say goodbye, to make them say goodbye by Zoom conference. I mean, for us, that's fine. Um, we can't have a large gathering right now uh, in person. We were supposed to, Gladys will tell you all about that. She worked. <laughs> She worked day and night and then some to try to make that happen, but, but to, to, to deprive people of that at the end of life. And I can tell you a lot of good souls did not do that. They allowed it and more power to them for doing that. Okay, super. Uh, we now have a question from one of our, uh, one of your listeners, Brian, and uh, she would like, she or he, excuse me, would like to know um, a little more about white coat black art. The name. The strange name. So White Coat Black Art. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, White Coat Black Art has been on the air on CBC Radio 1 since 2007. And I'm one of the co-creators of the show. Um, actually, you know, first, uh, the first pilot, you know, the first, the first concept of the show was in 2005. So it's, we're going on 15 years that, that this has kind of been, you know, a big part of my career. And, uh, you know, White Coat Black Art, the show is all about the experience of patients and family members in the culture of modern medicine. And, and we present the ideas that we tell stories about the patient experience. We tell stories about, about care providers. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a show on uh, burnout among people working on the front lines during COVID-19. The show um, has, has not been afraid to tackle racism in healthcare, to talk about queue jumping, to talk about uh, private healthcare. Uh, and, and not surprisingly, you wouldn't be surprised if I, if I told you that a lot of our programs deal with COVID right now. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about the confusion that, that people in Canada are increasingly feeling uh, about the, the so-called rules for staying safe during COVID. You know, first they said, don't wear masks. Then they said, wear a mask. And, and uh, what about mandatory masks? And, and if there's a vaccine, should I have a vaccine? And, um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, first they said uh, that kids could go back to school, but the kids couldn't, you know, they were supposed to go back to school with a class of 15 people. What should I say if there's 34 people in the class? And, 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 and so we're constantly updating it and trying to provide, uh, you know, updated information, but, but we, we were very good at plucking topics out of the zeitgeist. And right now 
confusion over what are the actual rules to keep us safe because you know the public health and and, and po politicians they don't seem to be speaking with one voice they seem to be changing their minds very very often so that those are the topics that, that we're talking about you know certainly since the pandemic began in march was declared in march we've been doing a lot of covid shows we're continuing to do other shows as well you know we did we did a show this past weekend on the experience of people with sickle cell disease when they come to the emergency department and some of their care is is governed by a fear of giving them opioids and unfortunately some of their care is governed by racism and of course this is a story uh, that 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 we heard about with the late Joyce Eshaquan, uh, who we mentioned in in our show, but but uh, we focused on people with sickle cell disease who are predominantly people of color, uh, people from uh, Africa and the Arabian Peninsula and and the Mediterranean countries as well. So that's that's a little bit about white coat black art. The the title uh, referred to you know the fact that health professionals wear. Uh, white coats, and or at least they used to, and and black art is really, that was a term that was used by my first producer to refer to the received wisdom, the emotional intelligence, the hidden curriculum of medicine, what, what the, the attitudes that seem to be prevalent in healthcare without them being written down in books and textbooks and, and in research articles. And, and uh, it was a catchy title, once a 15 year old uh, referred to it as, as a cool title, I knew we couldn't change it at that point. <laughs> Thank you, bro. And it is, it's a fantastic title. And also it's a fantastic program. And so I, I highly recommend it. Do tune in. Okay, so our next question, Dr. Goldman, is the following. Based on the lack of empathy among medical professionals, what can we do to get through to them? Well, um, there's a multi-pronged approach. What we can't do is berate them and shame them into being empathic, which is what we're, which what we will do. Shame on you for not being empathic. It's it's just it just makes people want to shrink away and 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 not engage. Um, you know, I think I think that that there. Are, you know, I let me give you some. I mean, I could spend hours talking about this, but let me give you some of the broad strokes. One of them is that. Uh, you can't ask health professionals to be empathic to patients if we're not empathic to one another, if the system doesn't treat us well. And, and, and that, that doesn't mean lavishing you know, food on us. It means that, that if, if you know, having somebody before they, they load us up with more stress and more work and more outcome measures and you know, a, a new system that says we have to change our password every, you know, every three months and, and so that we've got Five, uh, five computer systems, you know, one for x-ray and one for order entry and one for, one for tracking patients, et cetera, et cetera. And, 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 we have to, and each of them has different passwords that expire at different times. Um, and, and, you know, we work in an emergency department, for instance, where I go to three computers and the, and the system isn't working. It's, it's updating or, or you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it has to reboot. And, and, or the printer, you know, I want to print out some documents for the patient and, and I can't because the printer's offline, uh, you know, and, and, you know, you, you can't, you cannot uh, keep creating a system that's more and more complex without thinking at some point that we got to take some of the com complexity off the table. And, and, you know, we have a penchant in, in medicine to, to load up people and say, I got another thing for you to do. Just one more thing. It's just one, it's just one little thing. We'll have you do just one little thing. And we're, you know, we're heroes. Suck it up. One more thing. I, you know, it would be nice if the system would say, you know what, we, this is really important. This is why we think this is important. We know it's going to be onerous for you. We're going to take this other thing off your plate so that we're not adding to your list of tasks. If they had that kind of attitude, if they were more responsive to the needs of frontline people, then that alone would boost the empathy amongst amongst healthcare workers. Um, I think that um, some like some of us um, become burdened with moral distress, and that means, as I as I said during my talk, uh, when the rules and regulations or conventions or attitudes prevent us from doing what we think is the right thing uh, in the course of our duties, we suffer from moral distress. And this is not just a bad feeling in the tummy; it it is a direct cause of burnout. Uh, and and uh, uh, in addition, um, you know, having having a, a a a you know being being a witness to secondary trauma, 
Um, if, if, if we have a lot of that in our daily work and paramedics certainly do that, then they're at risk of developing PTSD. So in some cases, some cases, it, it, you know, we become emotionally overburdened and we actually have to t- be able to take time out. And you want to have a system that allows us to do that. Um, you know, if we suffer from compassion fatigue or, or from PTSD, we don't want to be afraid of being stigmatized for having a mental health issue. And that is something that is very common and very prevalent in healthcare. That's something that, that, that uh, will leave people feeling angry and embittered and not in a mood to empathize with other people. So, so those are some of the factors. You know, reduce the stress, address burnout, address compassion fatigue and moral distress. I'm giving them like, you know, like they're a laundry list and like they're easy peasy to do. Certainly during the time of COVID, they are very, very difficult to do. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, some say that there's an empathy crisis in healthcare and, and I believe it. What you can't do is send people to a course and say, here, learn empathy, learn your empathy lessons because that doesn't work as I hope I have explained to you. Okay, thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. I don't know how much time we have left, but I'll start with, with a few. First of all, I want to um, point out this fabulous book that you have written, uh, Dr. Goldman, The Power of Kindness, Why Empathy is Essential in Everyday Life. And we happen to have copies for sale um, at the uh, great reduced rate of $20 and all the um, uh, proceeds go to Peliaco. And my question, Dr. Goldman, Uh, refers to a concept in this book, and it really is a compelling read. And it was um, when you were in Japan, and maybe I'm not pronouncing it right, but the word was sanzaiken, I think, and the idea of presence. And we at Paliaco, um, you you know, our our, um, signature is... uh, support and respite care in the home. And the notion of presence seems to me to be very, very important in that. And I wonder if you could speak to that uh, concept in your, um, with the notion of kindness. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, Sons I Can is, 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 is a, a concept that pertains to, um, you know, it, it, it's part of Taoist uh, religion, uh, in, in and and you know, which is which is prevalent in Japan, and and uh, you know, people tend to think of of Sonzaiken when they're when you know people in the West tend to think of Sonzaiken when they think about um, something that seems bizarre on the surface, that inanimate objects have uh, Sonzaiken. So so for instance. Um, I'm just reaching down. This this spoon would have songs I can. I'm I'm not uh, your, uh, Uri Geller. I'm not going to bend it. Um, but but the the idea is that is that the person who ma- designed it or who manufactured it, um, the person who was on the assembly line that 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 made it, um, that somehow a part of their essence is 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 in this. So that's that's one thing that it means. Um, but it means other things too. Uh, you know, we we have we all or not we all, but many of us have pets. Uh, I'm I have a pet budgie upstairs, Sky, and and uh, and I'm I'm actually kind of surprised that she, I haven't heard her chattering because usually as, as soon as I start talking a lot, she starts to chatter a lot. It is possible that that the bird has been brought to the upstairs like two flights up, um, and so so she's out of hearing range right now, but but. The, the, the thing that I learned in Japan about, about Sonzai Kan when it comes to animals is that um, we attach ourselves to our animals and, and, and one of the ways that, that, that we experience animals is through Sonzai Kan. Um, when you experience so, so it's it's not just so the you know the, the Taoist explanation is that is that inanimate objects or pets have songs I can, but but to have songs I can have an impact on somebody you have to have a human being who feels it, who feels the presence of the other person. That that's Gladys. I'm finally getting to 
you may be wondering where the heck is this going. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the point is the point is Gladys, <laughs> that that um, knowing that my like my budgie has so as I can. That means when I close my eyes, I have a mental picture of what she looks like, and I even as she's plucking, grooming herself, plucking her feathers, I'm thinking, what is she thinking? What's going on inside her little her little brain? And and we will actually develop songs like can for inanimate objects that come and go, like like you know if you've ever had a Roomba vacuum cleaner, you know the little robot vacuum cleaner, which is another thing I learned about and 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 why we would you know uh, ascribe uh, songs like can to to your vacuum cleaner because it comes and goes seemingly at random, and when it comes to you, you think it's attaching itself to you, and when it leaves you. Uh, you think it's detaching itself a little bit like a cat, you know, like a, like a pet cat that that jumps into your lap sometimes and sometimes it and brushes against your leg and other times it just walks away like it doesn't care about you. And it leaves you wondering, does the cat like me? Does the Roomba like me? Why doesn't it like me now? Why hasn't it come? Oh, it's back. It likes me. Um, so now presence and 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 and, and Paliaco. Um, at whatever stage we're at in our lives, whether we are young and vibrant or whether we're in the last stages of our lives, we crave attachment to other people. We crave time and relationship with people who are meaningful to us. And, and, and I think, I think the, the fullest context of Sons I Can in, 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 at a time when somebody's receiving palliative care in their end of days is that at some point, the mask drops and they want to be seen. And, and if you've ever, you know, there, you know, there, there are two, there are many meanings to the phrase, I see you. One of them is, you know, we're going to meet at, at, we're going to meet at the plaza. Not so much these days. I see you. Okay. I see, you know, I'm on my phone. I see you. And then there is, I see you. I, the mask is dropped and I see what you're really all about or what you want me to see about you. And, and one of the best parts of that kind of companionship at the end of life is that people want to be seen. Um, you know, we tend to believe, you know, I've, I've had families in the emergency department who, you know, have brought uh, their grandparents or their parents and they've said, okay, so you're going to do a, they, they, you know, we, I do the history and physical, I feel a mass in their belly, it's not good. I walk out of the room and the, and the adult child follows and says, so you think it might be cancer? And I said, yeah, it might. Um, don't tell, don't tell my dad. You know, I, I it would kill him to know. There's a point at which people want to know, and 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 particularly as they as they get close to the end of their lives, there's a time when people want the mask to drop and just let's just everybody be real in this moment. And and that's the that's the true essence of companionship at the end of life. And and you know, it might be provided by a family member um, during COVID. It's difficult. And, uh, you know, loved ones are often thousands of kilometers away. And, and, you know, there are many, many apocryphal stories of people who remain alive long after it was thought that they were going to die because they're waiting for somebody to come. And I can tell you, in the case of my late mother, my late mother um, died 11 months after my father had passed away and we didn't tell her. She had dementia and we thought she couldn't comprehend. It turns out she did and on her deathbed, she was struggling to stay alive until we told her that he had died. And then only then she could die. And there was a look of comprehension on her face with that. So, so um, people do want to, they want to know the truth. They want to see and be seen. And I think, I think companions at the end of life uh, are so important to that. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have one more question and then uh, we will let you go. And it, it um, involves that um, the, the myths that you presented. That was very interesting, the myths about palliative care. And the one that really struck me was the one about hope. And because I, I find whenever I speak to someone about, I just say the word palliative and people uh, tense up. And so the, my question to you is, how do we get the message out that um, palliative care is really about hope and about living life to the fullest. Yeah. 
I, I, you know, I, I would start by, by talking about my own past, um, that, that, that I had a tendency, like a lot of other people, to either live in the regretful past or the worried future. And I, and I say to them, um, why are you, you know, why are you so focused on next week, next month, six months from now? Um, what would it mean to you to be able to live in this moment as if it's the only moment that counts right now? Uh, that, that's at a deep level. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, if you're looking for, for, you know, just conventional wisdom that, that might help, I, I would say that, that, you know, there are many unknowns to having a life limiting disease. I don't know how long, I don't know how long you'll live, but I don't know how long I'll live. And, and in that sense, we are together. So, so all of these are, are ways to try to, to, to get, you know, and maybe, and, you know, maybe, maybe helping that person explore what is it about the future um, that you're concerned about. And maybe the future is that, that, you know, my daughter seeing somebody, you know, I think it's kind of getting serious and, and it would be nice to be there for the wedding. Maybe it's something concrete and maybe it's something that, that a doctor can say, you know what, I can't, you know, I don't know how long you're going to live, but I think we can help you with that. So, so by verbalizing that kind of stuff, you know, those kinds of goals and, and priorities, um, uh, you, you turn an amorphous worry that might be symbolized by taking hope away, you know, and, and you turn it into a more manageable problem. And, 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 and hope, I think, you know, it becomes a metaphor or, or a symbolic way of saying um, that my life is so infinite that I don't have to think about the end at all. By taking my hope away, you've told me it's finite. And guess what? As I've said now twice, I'm going to say it again. It's finite for all of us. So make it a good one. Enjoy the moment. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's, it was a pleasure for me to introduce you and it certainly is my great pleasure to thank you, Dr. Goldman. Uh, you are indeed, as I already knew, a fabulous speaker and you've given us many important facts and we appreciate your generosity of sharing your personal stories. Uh, that's given us, I think, a model for ourselves to try to, to be more honest and, and empathetic. And so I wish you all the best. And uh, Paliaco is thrilled to have you with us. And we would invite um, everyone to spread the word about our great organization. And we, of course, are an NGO. And so we would appreciate any donations that you would care to make. And Dr. Goldman, do take good care. Thanks so much. You too. My pleasure. Nice, nice being with all of you today. Thank you.